this week on Hermitcraft. I just think you've got the most perfect face. I need it. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Hermitcraft Recap. My name is Pixorifs, our writer is Loy XP. Captions on this video were provided by Liara, and we drag ourselves away from Elden Ring Co-op to bring you the last news in Hermitcraft until they make more of those. Oh, come well, on. Well, he's killed me again, so uh, this is all you. Well, do uh, I don't know. Are you okay? Okay, he's okay. He's okay. Today, it is our sworn duty to signal all the community fan artists about the in-game gallery initiative Azumavoid revealed in this week's episode. Last recap, we made a sort of big deal out of the large modern build Corallus and him have been working on, and it turns out we should have made an even bigger deal out of it, since the project involves a unique opportunity for fans, where their art will be displayed in-game using new custom painting mechanics. As I mentioned, 1.21 allows us to introduce our own paintings. They can't be gotten in survival though, so you can't just randomly place this down and get it. Uh, this is our test image, by the way. This is, of course, a very delicate matter as far as labor and intellectual property goes, so we implore everyone to consider all the conditions and do some research on the Hermitcraft subreddit before jumping onto this opportunity. And to their credit, the Hermits seem to be taking their side of the deal very seriously. But if all that gets sorted one way or another, there's space for five art pieces dedicated to each Hermit, so fans will be able to get their art into Hermitcraft videos without drawing DocM77. And if all goes well, the cast will have a cool set of portraits to age instead of them. So if you're an artist and you want to get involved, I'd say just hold your horses for a moment. Don't jump into anything straight away. We still have some details to figure out. But with all that out of the way, let's take a look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Starting with Joel Smallish Beans, and you could say his videos have been quite the experience lately because he's been farming bottles of enchanting for sale. I just forgot to click record me doing some stuff. Now his comments were helpful enough to point out that the slime and slime blocks would be a more lucrative business. And to prove them wrong, Joel has indeed dug out some chunks and set up a collection system. So jokes on the commenters, his slime farm doesn't work. You can see how it's their problem and not his. Why, why are the rates terrible? Because it's, it is quite slow. Please experts, help me, help me. I don't know what I've done wrong. But to sell the greens he does have, Joel has built a towering shop amidst the commercial district where any passerby can purchase not just the experience bottles themselves, but even the mass deployment mechanism for them that will fix their equipment in seconds. This will be a hard sell in this at the age of portable silverfish based XP farms, but this is the man who sold out of honey the other day, so if nothing else, we can count on Doc M buying him out out of sheer respect again. But there you have it, the XP shop is complete. Let's just test this works. Yeah, very nice, that fix up our tools. Good times with Scar will also have to drive a hard bargain, both in that his wares are monsters and that he has a train to drive. The zoo station may be much nicer to look at now it's not floating a few blocks off the ground, and Scar did his best to make the build look lived in with details like a water tower for the locomotive's refill. And best of all, from the backside, you can't read it at all. It's a win-win. It looks better and <laughs> it doesn't say ooze, but zoo. But his permit for all mobs to sell won't do any good without the mobs to sell. And so Scar has to endure raid after raid to stock up on the ever popular Ravagers, as well as evokers and vindicators to offer his server mates for decoration. I got greedy. I thought how great it would be to have one of these Ravager jockeys. Think about how deadly that could be for pranks or mini games for our shop. And yeah, things didn't quite go well. That's why all my bits and bobs are floating in the water here. Zombie Cleo somehow finds an even more frustrating entity to work with when Impulse SV tasks them with recreating the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles hideout from the original 76 cartoon in the sewers beneath his base. It's very 80s nostalgia for me. Um, I, I mean, I grew up during the decade. I know what a lot of crud it was. Luckily, the texture on the turtle helmet is great for the back of their shells. If only the scoots for it didn't take actual hours of hit nose time to farm. The final diorama features a nicely detailed system, retro gaming consoles, and Splinter looking somehow much better than his original Playmates toy did. A, a 3-4 TV-ish, uh, and then doing like a, a, a Super NES? That was like the, sorry, SNES. Gesundheit. Cleo also finds their own unique way to circumvent the pop-up shop rules by simply connecting a small stall in shopping land to their hay bale store at the impound lot with a long glowing tunnel. Uh, for those of you who don't know for, uh, Dodgy Frank, Dodgy Frank was uh, the guy that sold me stuff on the witchcraft SMP that I was on. 
and I figured he could come and join me in this misadventure. He's very dodgy. His name is Frank. I, Jevin, tries a different approach to a hole-in-the-ground shopping experience and actually decorates a small mine shaft to serve as the coal shop for his permit. We're going to be selling coals, one of our permits. Um, unfortunately, those stupid permits. I don't like them. Sure, it is much more humble than the absolute cloud of foliage Jevin builds for his base, hoping to eventually expand his base grove into spooky season. But you can't argue his shop pops up when it very evidently pops the exact opposite direction. I, like, I really wanted to keep that sort of rugged theme throughout, so we've got coal ore everywhere. I am not about to charge people a lot of money for coal, considering Joe gave me all this coal in the first place, it doesn't matter. The XB Crafted Ocean Monument Base and Polar Bear Sanctuary receives a generous donation of iceberg designs, so before long XB finds himself in a flow state and serves up some tasty burgers. The bears haven't fully moved in yet, but it's worth checking out just for his pronunciation of lichen. Uh, so, as you can see, I do have, like I said, some of the, the lichen around, the, the, you know, the glow lichen. Yeah, so we need to get some glow lichen on here. But other than that, I freaking love it! But the peace and quiet is interrupted by two major disturbances, one of them self-inflicted. As he receives coupon entry for Ravager Rush, Etho's frog-alike in the basement of the frog light shop, an XB has to demonstrate his aptitude for fearlessly running into traffic. How do you even... Am I even gonna make it across this once? Oh, you jerk. <laughs> The other disturbance is somewhat less voluntary. The clanking and whirring of Mumbo's iron shop has caught the ears of XB and Corralis, and they've started a petition which iGevin is more than happy to sign in the event that a class action lawsuit can be tailored to match Mumbo's business casual. Have you considered just blowing it up? I, I, but then he could sue me. Oh yeah, that's true. Impending legal issues aren't even the cause of Mumbo's gray hairs. At least, not yet. I, yeah, you that's didn't a good know that was there, did you? No, this is kind of concerning. <laughs> and it's not even the weirdest thing about his businesses because someone on the server is sending out free samples on behalf of his gold shop. Okay, I'm happy with this, but why? Why? Why is someone pretending to be me? It's no surprise that Mumbo wants something vaguely normal amongst all this weirdness, so he builds an actual house for himself atop the cliffside jumble of shop fronts, radio antennae, and conspicuous chemical accidents. The real test now is whether or not he'll get any living done. Now phase one of his base is done and he can move on to phase two. So I would highly appreciate your suggestions down in the comment section and maybe this is something that I'll need to call some help in for. BOO vowed never to do armor stand magic, but here he is practicing the dark arts. Ironic because he points out the stack of chests and barrels doesn't cast a shadow, but then again neither does a vampire. Impatient to dive into the server's latest minigame, mostly because it provides the lighting for the Cyberpunk City project, B-Dubs takes his own mail directly from Etho's house before it's ever sent, and we can't work out if this is a federal crime or not. Fortunately, he's good enough at Ravager Rush that he can score a few frog lights and potentially pay Etho back for breaking and entering. He takes opening boxes to a whole new level as he demonstrates a shulker box parkour idea in front of Cubfan, which probably means there'll be a new section of the Holmdel Maze by next week. Wow! Oh, did I fall? I no, fell, you didn't! Did nope. Guys, oh, I'm oh, scared! Go, You're doing it! He's got it! He's got <laughs> it! Let's go! Back at his and Impulse's concrete jungle, he adds a 7-Eleven style convenience store and a townhouse to the block, and tries out navigating the city in orthographic camera mode, which gives the whole area a very SimCity vibe. It's all fun and games until someone punches a silverfish. But I think this is really cool. You could make game modes. This would be cool in Frogger, even. At least he finally acknowledges the subliminal messaging in the billboard Joel Smallish Beans left for him, which is that billboards are there to be seen, but not heard. I don't even know if I've ever seen him ride a horse. You know, you know I love horse. After an extended family break, Rendog is back and has made himself a to-do list to keep his jet-lagged brain on task. Unfortunately, this is immediately derailed by someone filling his car with honey and customers buying up the entire stock of his beacon store. I mean, I'm just assuming it was the space rats. Of course no hermit would do this to me while I was on holiday. Of course they wouldn't, right? But it's not all bad. Scootball has become an international sport while he's been traveling, so he gets to show off all the community-created arenas as he contemplates what to do with his own. He gets a taste of how the armadillos feel while practicing for Azuma's Mace Race Tournament, flinging himself into the air repeatedly while telling us about his earthbound travels. I've never seen valleys of such huge immensity. My little brain was unable to fathom the geothermical tectonic powers or whatever that were needed to create this place. 
At least now he's back, he can get to work on his pottery business. He's already amassed a huge quantity of sherds, now all he needs is a sherp to sell them out of. And finally there's Doc M, whose game of Texas Gotham has drawn a fair amount of attention. Which is good, because he's drawn a fair amount of cards. Now moving on to the face cards, he makes them literal face cards, appointing himself the King of Diamonds, as if building all his redstone contraptions out of diamond ore wasn't enough. Suited connectors. <laughs> Not the best poker hand you can get. But I'll take it. There's some cute logic to how he dishes out the other rolls in the Court of Cards, but he has to figure out how he's going to conceal all of this. It turns out his plan is to build a laundromat above the secret gambling den, but the laundry business will sell dirt, presumably putting it back in circulation after washing it out of everyone's clothes. To generate the dirt, Doc assembles a machine that generates stone, converts it to moss, turns the moss to podzol thanks to some 2x2 spruce trees, then explodes the podzol and some of the spruce wood using TNT. We were going to make a joke about how dirt doesn't just grow on trees, but redstone innovation has foiled us again! We'll see if he actually gets around to building the shop by this time next week, because Cubfan invites him to the mace race and reels him back in to searching for windburst books. We'll know for sure if he doesn't find one when someone plays the King of Diamonds and his face looks very, very tired. And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP, and my name is Pixel Riffs. Captions on this video were provided by Liara. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.